everybody. Welcome back to Beyond the Facade podcast. I'm Doña Junta. I'm Sabrina. And we're having a special episode today in collaboration with Slanguage Studio in Wilmington. Um, this October is their 20th anniversary, and I will be doing a project with them, and the podcast will be part of that. So this is a special episode, and I hope you guys enjoy. You're welcome. So the topic today is something that I have always pretty much, we, we, we discussed through the different podcasts and we have engaged everybody in, but today we're going to talk about the impact of institutionalized history in Los Angeles. And if you guys follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I have a lot, I do a lot of research on a lot of the uh, institutions uh, here in LA and, and other places, but mostly here in LA. So we're going to talk about the ones that are pretty much uh, here abandoned and some of the history behind these places and, you know, get into discussion of why this matters. And um, we'll just kind of start talking about the ones that we've gone to and visited over the years, I guess, now. Yeah, it's been it's been a period of time. Yes. And this was important because these places have had a lot of impact on all of us, um, especially growing up in the 90s, 80s and 90s. And just knowing people that um, have been to these places and they're still there, symbolically still there, abandoned. And since we talk a lot about architecture, I mean, maybe the architecture is not as significant, but it has a lot of meaning behind it. Well, as our uh, title of our podcast, and we're really going beyond the facade, we're reaching into the history and we're reaching into the stories that lie there because they deserve to be told. Right, so we're going to bring up the juvenile halls in the area and the CYAs and one special one, which is not neither, but it's still connected, which is the general hospital. Yes, you're your favorite lady. <laughs> so we'll start off with discussing the juvenile halls. And it's interesting because um, Central Juvenile Hall is one of the first juvenile hall here in LA. Um, it, it's in Boyle Heights. It opened up in 1912 and it originally was called Los Angeles Juvenile Hall and it, it became established when they started the juvenile court system and back in those days in the earth turn of the century kids were going to juvenile hall for really all kinds of crimes but if you were like a kid that was like an orphan you were begging uh, you had uh, you're a vagrant there was prostitution or even abuse like if you came from a home that was abusive even though that's not a crime you still got sent to juvenile hall punitive yes now they, they renamed it east lake or central it closed down maybe like two or three months ago and it was by emergency order they've been wanting to close this juvenile hall for many years and they just the county kept pushing it and they finally there were some lawsuits so they pretty much Closed it about three months ago, but it was, like, very random. The They pretty much took all the kids, didn't even tell their parents, and shipped them off to Silmar, which is another place. We're not going to talk about Silmar today, but they shipped them off, and then they shut it down. And the, the parents were upset because they went to go visit their children on Saturday to find out that they weren't They're missing. even there. Yeah. yeah. So what is that? Right. Wards of the state. Exactly. So we're going to talk about a little bit our experience kind of exploring Central. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, I know that you didn't really know people that went there, but. I mean, I'm sure we did. It's just it hasn't come up in conversation. More or less, I see it when we have adventures. And because it's connected to where it's connected to, we're there often enough. And just where it's situated, it's like behind everything. And um, it's very lonely. So let's describe the area. It's in Boyle Heights, and it's like a little hub because we got the hospital there, General Hospital. Then across the street, we have Lincoln Park. And then there's like the USC campus, different buildings around there. So it's like a little circle area, but it's like really old. And there's train tracks there too. Yeah. So it's surrounded by train tracks. So, you know, obviously, it's since it's the oldest one, it kind of really looks kind of beat up and deteriorated it's about time they closed it down and it, it, it has looked lonely for years and now it's it's a ghost yes 
And I did go yesterday to go look at it since it's been completely closed. And there's still staff there, I think, working probably in the offices or like maintaining the building. But, you know, got some footage of the front. It, it's just, it was pretty much ready to be done. So that was one of the main places that was, it, it impact because a lot of kids in the 90s, Pretty much there was a time where people were uh, were getting charged as adults. And it, it kind of was known as a place where if you got life in prison as a juvenile, a lot of them were housed there. So I see. And a lot of people I know now that are older and got out as lifers had been there. So they remember it. Yes. But what do you think of the how it looks? Like, what what is your experience? I know we were only in the outside, but what are your, your thoughts about that? My thoughts are that they're kind of forgotten. It's it's in the back. It's It, it gives an idea of, of being ashamed or being put away, you know, away from the rest of the hospital. And that whole area is just, it's huge just for the hospital and the medical buildings there. And it sits behind everything. And all you really see if you come around that corner, right, that sharp corner, you see the train tracks and that are down in that, like, for lack of a better phrase, ditch area. Yes. And you see all the homelessness off to Lincoln Park, right, that little bridge that you can walk up to get up there. And um, it's definitely hidden. If you didn't know it was there, you would never know what was there. And we have children rotting, or we had children rotting there for years. Right, and it's like a ugly yellow color. Yes. So we we'll watch photos. It's it's a very ugh looking <laughs> building. I don't know if that's even a word, but well, it ugh works. <laughs> so juvenile hall central, where it's basically where the you start when you start this institutional path as a youth. Central was one of the main ones. And then the next one was one that was more known to us in the Harvard area is LP or Los Padrinos located in Downey. Um, That was built in 1957. And the reason they built that is because Central was overcrowded. There was like people sleeping on the floor or kids sleeping on the floor. They just, the population was going up and up and it was completely overcrowded. So they, they decided to build LP in 1957 and that one closed not long ago either. It was closed in 2019. So currently it is abandoned. So it hasn't been too long. No. But LP was a little bit more known to us because people we knew. That's where our friends went. Yeah. <laughs> That's where they went. <laughs> they went there. Mm-hmm. And back in those days, it was, unfortunately, it was a gang uprising of gang culture. So a lot of people we knew were going there. It was almost a badge of honor to go there. As a juvenile, like, oh, I went to LP. Yeah, you were someone. Like, you weren't someone until you made it to LP, right? Right. And it's dysfunctional, but that's what was happening at the time. And my husband was in LP, too. He started going there at 12 years old. And at 12, they have a little kid unit called Unit W. And it was a dorm. I don't know if, I don't know if he was... When he was there, they had these... Disney paintings on the wall, oh which my. is looks very. I could imagine that looks creepy and sad. It it's kind of it 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 goes against everything that like why would they even inspire Disney movies to these juveniles and why like I wonder the crimes. Do you know the crime your husband uh, committed? I think to it get was there? just like being defiant to his mom. Wow. Yeah, and they, instead of, like, maybe a different intervention, they put them... Well, you, when they arrest you, they take you there first. Yeah, and yeah. And then they do the rest. Yeah, and so they're like, here's Disney. Here's Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Here's Mickey Mouse, you 12-year-old asshole that's not doing what they're supposed to do. Right. Watch Disney. So they were really tough on crime during those times in the they 90s. Were. It was really an era where, even in the media, it was... They call it this. Everybody's heard the during the Clinton administration, the super predator, just describing, you know, mostly people of color as being predators and just these really bad, dysfunctional people. And they it was seen that way because you're locked up. So it was like it validated what the media was saying. It certainly did, at least from the onlooker who's way far away from what's going on or knows the history of 
the U.S. and California. And, uh, yeah, it's easy for people to just say, lock them up. Three strikes, get them off our street. Right. right? Clean up our streets. Yes. So LP was more of the harbor area for us. And I was surprised when it was closed. So we did get to go when it was closed recently, last year. I yeah. believe we went for the first time. I did go again a couple of times um, just to see, kind of get a vibe of the place. What are your thoughts about kind of being there? Well, I was there once. Oh, you went to visit? Yes. My the father of my children. Back in the 90s? He, back in the 90s. I was still a juvenile. I had my daughter, my oldest daughter. So this is probably like 1997, 98, something like that. And I was literally talking to his sister on the way over here to film this so I knew what we were talking about we're pretty certain it was at uh LP but he was incarcerated for under six months I think he stole a stupid bike or something like that he was gang related doing all kinds of stuff like that so it was you know no coincidence that he stole a bike and ended up there I went with his mother once to try to go visit him but because we weren't married and because I was a juvenile I was not allowed to see him and I had to sit on stairs that's the only thing I really remember Remember, it felt like a long drive. And you and I had this conversation when we're young, you know, a long drive could have been to Downey from Carson, right? Yes, out of town. Yeah, and now it's like nothing, right? But back then, it could have been a very long drive. But it's also 25 plus years ago. But I remember it just being so sad because I couldn't see him. That's what I remember being as a kid. And as an adult going back, it was really sunny and hot. And the buildings just, they look like office buildings and it doesn't, and it leads me to think, as I always think about these things, is it, it's not really meant for children. It's not a place for children. It's, it's, it's an adult place that's to incarcerate children. And um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but how are we expecting people to act like adults or like their age if we treat them like animals and separate them and lock them and tell lock them up and tell them, you know, like you're no good, you're not going to go anywhere, and there's so much more to this, and I don't want to I don't no, want to go on. We'll we'll fine. get into this a little bit later, but um, the only the one thing that stood out for me when we went were the big tall walls. They were so tall, yes, and they were kind of in their own art way, very beautiful what did i say like not egyptian but like high girl the hieroglyphs yeah they kind of look like that hieroglyphs they were but they were so tall you couldn't see over them no. like if you were to get on my shoulders and yes i've had to hold her up a couple of times <laughs> to do some adventuring okay so if i had to put you on my shoulders which would have been bananas to see that there still you would not have been able to see over it no it was really tall and it kind of reminds you of like the gate of like oz like it's a locked in city and you're not welcome to look in there no however i did go back with raul because he okay. was there as a kid several times and um we went to the parking lot because it has a three-story parking lot i guess for staff we went to the top roof of it and then you could see oversee all the campus why didn't we think of that I think we were just freaking out. Like, now there's security, but at the time... We could have done all kinds of stuff. (laughs) I know, we could have. So, from the top, it just looks like very old buildings. Like, they were... He said there were dorms. Most of them were dorm living. And, you know, a big lawn in the middle. I think there was, like, a barbecue pit. He said that the staff would always barbecue, and they would smell the barbecue, and they obviously couldn't have any. You're making me hungry as we speak. (laughs) And he pointed out kind of like where the little kids unit was at and different things like that. But it's completely silent. There's like birds chirping. Very different. And we'll talk about what hap- what's going to happen to all these places at the end. But he he felt like, wow, like this was the place where everything started for him. Well, imagine too, just work- walking as an adult, even if I didn't have the knowledge that I had. If I knew that this place what it is what it is, right? And then you got the golf course. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, there's a fancy golf course across this, just across way. the parking lot. Yeah, across the way. So that was weird. But Downey's kind of nice. I don't know, yeah. like, why they put it there. Because I don't, I could, I, I can't even start to speculate why they would. But it's just, it's like night and day. Yeah, during his early days, I think 
because um, Rancho Los Amigos is around the corner. Yes. So I think just institutions in general were common because they were, well, they were close. Now we see big difference. They're not close. They're far. Yeah. But back then, these places, they're in LA, you know, you get in trouble, this is where you're at. Exactly. So LP definitely hits closer to home and currently abandoned. And so the next one was a little, it's kind of related to LP because it had those pink high walls. So this was McLaren Hall. And I had heard of McLaren Hall like for years. I like, I always heard of it as a place like that had controversy, but I didn't really know too much about it or seen it until we decided to go, I had forgotten about it. Agreed, agreed, I had heard about it, but like in passing and and yeah, I, I didn't know much about it until we researched it and so went to look at some, it. Yes, some history about McLaren Hall. So Juvenile Hall, Central and LP are for kids that obviously for in, you know, if there's a crime committed, truancy, things like that. Now, there's another sector of kids that are dependency kids or foster kids. That Now, later on, they, they decided to um, divide those kids. Like, the kids that came from abusive homes, they got taken away from parents. They were no longer deemed as criminal because at, at one point, they were all in juvenile hall. So, they, they built McLaren Hall kind of making it like, okay, we need to have these foster kids or kids that got removed in a different setting that's not as you know maybe vicious as the juvenile halls so they were thinking right however um it didn't go right at the end they got it so wrong so mclaren hall is in el monte and at first it was run by probation department and then dcfs took over and it was again for children in foster in foster care it was built in 1961 and it closed down in 2003 and the reason it closed down is because there was allegations of abuse towards children and there's a huge lawsuit that shut it down the county had to shut it down and to this day there's still lawsuits with kids that were at mclaren hall that were abused and it's still going on which is even more weird and sad so mclaren hall when we went that was very interesting it was to me it was it held uh, more of a deeper meaning because the kids are like it's sad because it, not that the other kids in juvenile hall don't have get no empathy they do but th- in this case it was kids that were removed for abuse or they didn't have parents so it felt different in a sense right well I remember that day pretty well and it was the strange day when we went to El Monte and it was like overcast and sunny like it kept going in and out and when we got to McLaren Hall it started sprinkling and raining and it looked dr- and I love the dreary feel, but it sure gave that as- atmospheric kind of feel driving upon it and seeing those walls and seeing going out and looking at all the little detailing of the building. And that place is sad. It has sadness. It, it permeates the walls. I can feel it. And I'm sure you- even if you can't intuitively feel it, you can still empathize with what possibly, like, what we can only imagine what happened behind those walls. Yes. And the reason that we were in El Monte, because we were going to, we did another episode with a friend that grew up in El Monte, so we wanted to get kind of landmarks of El Monte. So we kind of stumbled across it because of that reason. Yes. But going and looking at it, I was like, whoa, it had, like, 50-foot walls, almost like the juvenile hall. Yes. So they were already were like, we're, you're staying in this place. You're yep. not getting out. And they were kind of that institutional beige color. And then I said McLaren Hall Children's Center, like very innocent. Very, yeah. The front is like brick. Kind of like a school sort of. Looks office, like a like. school in the front. It kind of does with the the, pl- the flagpole and everything. And then the flagpole kept clicking. Yeah. I was like, this it is was creepy. It was windy. <laughs> you got scared. You just get scary easy. Yeah. So, so, uh, what was interesting is I just did some, you know, some pretty brief history and I posted the video about McLaren Hall and what was a lo- what was kind of sad is a lot of people reached out that had, uh, former children that were there now are adults in their thirties and forties that had been, had been there and they had, a, you know, ov- obviously a horrible experience and they shared their stories 
And it, it hit differently because of what they'd gone through. And they thought that people didn't remember McLaren Hall. It was kind of lost in the wind. Like, it had... he One of them in particular, he was very surprised, like, that I posted that because nobody really, like, knew the extent of what he'd gone through. Yeah. And so it was, like, good and bad for him. Like, he liked that there was recognition that this is a place became kind of awful yes but it also kind of i'm sure had some memories and triggers Triggers, yeah yeah but it again it's shut down uh it's and we'll talk about what happened after but that place was a little bit off the wall and of course all these child uh juvenile facilities all of them we have to remember children were incarcerated in them and yes in mclaren hall they were incarcerated in them but they didn't do anything wrong so imagine just you know your destiny is to be stuck inside somewhere because you don't have good parents and not because you're a bad person or committing crimes or even acting out. And then you, you know, are subjected to these abuses. And And it's no wonder that kids, you know, suffer to this day or adults are suffering to this day because of this. Right. Up until a month ago, they had a news press conference with some of the former kids and there were adults and they were bawling like, they had a hard time there. And mind you, like maybe those kids during that time, you know, that gone through trauma or whatnot, and maybe they were acting out or feeling like whatever was going on through them, but they still had no reason to staff to literally physically or a lot of sexual abuse to these vulnerable children. So that's a very, very controversial place, probably more than all of them. I think so. And there's something reminiscent of like the, the whole, um, the Catholic schools, the residential schools that Native Americans right. w- suffered under and, you know, mass m- murders and and sexual abuse. And it's, it's modern. It's in our time. And, you know, like our generation and their children and the parents should pay the consequences for it. Yes. And we should never forget. Uh, yeah, for sure. And that's why it's important to bring up McLaren Hall. So... Just to continue to kind of get, paint a picture, so when you go into as a youth, if if you commit a crime, you start in juvenile juvenile hall. If based on your case, if they give you you know a certain amount of time, then they'll they'll send you they could send you to a camp, and there's a bunch of camps all over LA that kids were going to, but if the cl- crime was more serious or you had your multiple offender you you know kept going in and out often then you would get sent to the california youth authority which is another notorious set of institutions that are finally shut down but they did a lot a lot of a lot of damage over hundred well over a hundred years yes i don't want to say hundreds but a lot we can say hundreds it doesn't matter but a hundred right hundred two hundred same thing so here in la we had two and they're pretty famous we have fred c nellis correctional facility and that was formerly known as the whittier state school for boys and girls later turned into the state school for girls for boys i'm sorry and it was built in 1891 initially was considered a reform school and then it closed down in 2004 so that went through a lot of changes. The, when it was built in the 1800s, it used to look kind of like Preston Castle, which is another facility up north. <laughs> That's all connected. Everything's yes. interconnected, guys. Everything. So, Fresi Nellis, and then I'm just going to jump back. Uh, the reception center that you go to before you go to Fresi Nellis is a Southern Youth Correctional Reception Center in Norwalk and clinic in Norwalk. And that one is still there abandoned. It, it was built in 1954 and enclosed in 2012 so that one is still there so you go there first and then they kind of assess you to see where you you're gonna go because they, they have different institutions all over california and fred c nellis was the one here in la it was the closest but you could get sent anywhere but we're going to be highlighting fred c nellis so let's first talk about the reception center because i know we went there during the <laughs> pandemic as well we did and Raul was also there, my husband. <laughs> he was there three months. I think you were there for three months, and then you get shipped out to wherever else. 
And I kind of always wanted to see it. So that's when we went. And it's hard to see because it's a huge main street, which is Bloomfield. And you can't really stop there, but we kind of drove around a few times. So we made it work. We, we saw some stuff. What are your thoughts about that place? Uh, it's next to a park. Uh, it was hard to get into, which just only goes to show you that what are they hiding? Why is it so hard? Why, what's up with the lack of transparency? These are our children. It's, it, these are children that are committing crimes. I mean, of course, there's always going to be kids that have, um, you know, personality defects and whatnot, but it's mostly because of trauma going on in their life. So they need redirection, but why is there this transparency? And, and it's punitive. There's nothing, there's no help. And the lack of transparency just um, goes to show that they run their own show and they treat them like adults and... How do you expect these kids to heal and become better? So that's my thoughts. I don't have a lot of, of, of history with this right. s- this place specifically, but from the day when we were trying to go and, and get it, um, some photos and some visuals, it was really hard because it was, it was hidden. Yes. And just to kind of remind everybody th- – the California Youth Authority is run by the state. So once they're out of the county juvenile facilities, the state takes over. So these facilities are state institutions. So it's just a higher level. And yeah, with, with uh, SRCC, it was very hard to see. You just barely see like the, the gate is kind of transparent a little bit. Like, I mean, it has like the slits. You mm-hmm. can see like when you're driving, you can see the shadows of the buildings. But nothing too much more than that, except for the sign, which is like a brick. A lot of the YAs were made out of brick for some reason. I don't know why. I guess it was the style during the 50s, since that one was built in the crazy 50s. 50s. (laughs) Um, But just, so it's been shut down. And then after that, but when it was open, kids could get sent to Fred C. Nellis or short uh, for short Nellis and you could spend up to the age of 25 there depending on your crime if you got juvenile life that would be up to 25 years old or a few years or whatnot once you're 18 I think you could some people got shipped out somewhere else but I have heard now that some stay there older which is more rare but I guess they did what they wanted to but Fred C. Nellis was I, that one was really impactful and we went there not long ago but well kind of seems like we've been there a couple m- multiple times honestly it's probably been like seven years now when we first went with Wayne yeah to explore it but this was this one was interesting because of, of the long history since it was built in the 1800s up until they closed it down in 2004 but like I was kind of sharing with her like I always thought of these places like just from the 90s right like nothing beyond that the 90s ya babies right it's really hard to think of it so far beyond you know and this has been integral in our history in the state of california yes but this one goes way back to the 1800s and and its namesake (laughs) yes and even from back then it wasn't any better than the 90s it was actually worse in, in many for many reasons. And I did a whole series on this place. Um, I mean, they would make kids wear like the Oregon boot where they'll have like this big metal boot on their legs so they won't run away because I guess there was a lot of runaways. Uh, black and Latino kids were giving these like psychological tests and they were not culturally competent, of course. Language was difficult. So... Because the testing was difficult for Latino and black kids, they would be considered feeble-minded. So if you were there, you're feeble-minded. And um, just another point is that the that part just made it more challenging for... And also eugenics and things like that, which yeah. was horrible. And what does that sound like? It sounds like, you know, 1950s, 60s voting in the South and how they used to make African-Americans write a you know write something or test 
if they can vote. So like this is just this is I don't think that maybe the viewers they understand the listeners and they understand but this is something that's ingrained in this country. So this is not something that's new. This is and it's continued to this day. Yes, absolutely. And there is just a lot of controversy. There is a lot of death there. Suicides, sexual th- abuse. A lot of abuse, uh, physical and sexual that during the early days was there was some documentation of it, but there was not as much advocacy as maybe there could be today. So a lot of the stuff they got away with. And the reform school stayed that until about the 50s and then it turned into the California Youth Authority. And that's the one that we know now as, as a label as that. But the premise of it has been going on since the 1800s. So why, do you, why is Fresinellas, do you think impactful for you there's many reasons but off the top i want to say that this little project our podcast that's now bloomed into something so much more than our you know idea of just sharing our opinions was really formed on the back of nellis yes it was your research um we went to go to nellis's gravesite yes we wanted to talk to nellis and so say, fred like, was a man fred he was a man he was a no- superintendent and he was nothing more, but yet his namesake stand stood there and just till recently. And um, we wanted to know why and ask him why he would do that. And of course, we didn't get much answer. No. Those ghosts, they're so fickle. <laughs> but um, we, we went into not necessarily pay our respects, but kind of for answers and just, just to fill so out So tell the them where he's buried. He's buried in a cemetery. Yes. I can't remember off the top of my head. So That's Fred, why I stopped there. Fred C. Nellis was many, one of many superintendents that ran the school. Supposedly, he was one of the better ones. I still think that he had a lot of work to do because he used to... Um, he, he, didn't, he had some controversy. He had but he was better than the other ones that were like more beating the children. I don't know how much better, but he was just... he. He got famous as the superintendent and they named, obviously they named the school or the YA after him later during his death. They, it was still called the Whittier state school, but he, so we went to go visit his grave. We did. And it was in Inglewood cemetery. Yeah, that's where it was. Down the street. It's not yes, far. It's not far. It took a while to find the plot because. Twice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just, there's so many people there. But we finally found it. And he was there with his family, buried there, his wife, I think, and some... And his sister, I think. Yeah, a few other people. He has a big stone that says Nellis. So it was just weird. It was just ironic. Again, we weren't like, oh my God, mourning his passing. No. And I'm not hating him or anything, but it was just kind of to see who is this man? Where is he? Yeah, it was just... It's kind of... it, It really meshed some of our stuff, meaning... Your love for research, my love for the darkness and cemeteries. And I was like, let's do this. Let's do it. We hadn't adventured in a long time. It was COVID. Let's do it. Yes. And we kind of just went there. And I don't know maybe if we went for answers or we just wanted to sit on it and just kind of be in the same airspace with someone who now has this infamous name where your husband had been. As well. Where many people we knew had been. Mm -hmm. And... um. It was it was a moment that sparked our our interest in thinking that we wanted to tell you guys our opinion and how we feel and share with you guys. So that was really significant. Yes, and you said that from there we went to Preston. I couldn't remember. Yeah, because he has ties to Preston Castle. Yeah, I mean obviously the Youth Authority and everything like that. And then you were like, "Let's go to Preston Castle," and I was like, well, and "Let's Preston do it." Is in Ione. It's in Ione, California, right which next to like, Mule Creek State Prison. Which is like five, six hours, maybe? Shoot, no. It's probably, well, maybe on the five. Okay. Me driving on the 99, probably like eight. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then uh, Nellis, then we had other friends that started a podcast, Incredible Javier. He went to Nellis. Uh, Raul went to Nellis for about maybe a couple years. 
and then move somewhere else. So there was a Nellis was like their high school and homeboys that were like chiming in, and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. And even homeboys that went to Preston Castle. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of people were there during the time, but during the the time they were there, it was just chaos. You know, a lot of chaos, lots of fights every single day, a lot of stuff going on. They did rebuild it in the '60s too to those brick buildings because they used to be old cottages, and then they redid it with those rotunda kind of like yes. looking things. Yeah. But it when it, after 2004, it stayed closed for many years. I think they used it for filming locations, for shows. And me, Sabrina, and Wayne went. So luckily, that's probably the last time we seen it abandoned. Yes. And we went and kind of looked around the fencing. Which is huge. It's yes. a huge area. It is. And or was, I should say. I mean, you could see the buildings, the overgrown grass. Like, it was just, I wish we could have gone in. But it was a good experience to actually see it in person, at least one last time of the way it was, because now today is completely different. It's completely different. And, you know, it's right across King Richard's right there. Oh, yeah. And so people, can you imagine people just driving by and like, hey, kids, let's go get some antiques, you know? I used to. And I didn't really realize the severity of what was on the other street and i think that's another problem with these institutions in general is that we they're hidden from the public because the public doesn't want to know a kid commits a crime a person we wash our hand they go to court we wash our hands of them and we don't want to see them we don't want to know about them we don't even want to know why they committed the crime right and we don't it's an eyesore so we see these buildings and we're like hey what's that but do we really do research into it? And no, we don't. And that's why these injustices continue and they spiral is because we are not invested as a community and hold accountability. Yes. And I don't think I mentioned it, but yes, it's in the city of Whittier. So it's off Whittier Boulevard. Yep. And so it, it's, you know, Whittier is kind of nice now. I don't know how it was back then, but. Now it's different, and we'll, we're going to talk about how different it is now. But it's still the ground of the place just permeates this heaviness that probably never go away. The trees. The trees. The trees hold secrets that we will never know unless we listen very closely to the whispers. And just to, like I was saying, there was a controversy there. One person or child that we do want to remember and kind of pay our respect to is a kid named Benny Moreno and Benny Moreno at the time I think was 12 or 13 something like that and he got sent to the reform school he was a one out of like eight or ten kids he was he was in a huge family and I think he was living in the valley at the time with his parents and he might have either smoked a cigarette or something very petty and he got sent to the reform school he did and back then they were really harsh with with some of the the time anyhow he got sent to the box or the shoe where um, you get kind of locked up like in the hole they're all different names the reason he got sent there is because i believe he tried to run away and he got caught and that was like the punishment so when he was in the in the sh- in the hole which was also single cell, very, um, pretty much no, like I don't isolation. know if they had windows, but it was isolation. And he was there and there was other, there's rows of, you know, different single cells, but the story went that he committed suicide. I guess they said that they found him hanging from like a sheet or something or a belt. And, and, but I believe the family and some people that were helping the family felt that th- that was not the case. And I think one of the neighbors was like, no, like he would never do that. And they ended up investigating it. And it was rare at the time because this is like the 30s. Yeah. So it was rare for a Mexican family to get kind of that kind of help. Right. Right. So they ended up, what do you call when they bury some, they take somebody out? They exhume. The, they, they exhumed his body. And they did examine it and found damage that wasn't matching what they had said that he had committed suicide. So they did go to court and like they were trying to, you know, sue the school. 
long story short, the staff at the school collaborated. They weren't going to let nobody go down. So they lost the suit. But, to you know, the, the family did believe that he ended up getting killed or by a staff member somehow. Uh, and that was just really sad. And they showed his picture. He was just like this little kid. Yeah. And he was there for like a really petty reason. And for him to die there was really sad. It, it is. And as a parent, can you imagine that we have to, you know, hold these people as caregivers if they commit a crime that, you know, there's nothing else we, we can do about it. And then to find out that your child dies in their care and in, in their possession because they are like a possession of the state. Right. And they call um, them wards. Exactly. And so I can only imagine how that felt devastating. So what we did what we always do. And we went and found Benny. Yes. And we went and spent some time with him. Yes. Um, we found that he was buried at North Hollywood Vallejo or something cemetery. Vallejo Brothers or something like that. Something like that. And we kind of find him faster than Ellis. <laughs> we did. <laughs> <laughs> we took him flowers and just kind of like reminisced on, man, what is, he was just a kid and he went through, he was at Nellis and died there. So... It was just kind of symbolic, like paying our respects. And I mean, I think about it too. This is just a thought as we're talking about that. That could have been Raul. Yeah. It could have been really anyone because there's no accountability for staff or, you know, who knows what happened to poor Benny. He could have been being bullied and maybe other wards did that to him and then they they covered it up. Staff yes. could have done it to him. One thing's for sure that he had... Um, you know, bruises or he had, he had wounds consistent of it, not just being a suicide. So something more happened and we may never fully know, but we do know that, um, it's not his fault. And we're sad that he was, right. he left. I believe I did read in the report that there might've been some sexual abuse and he was kind of retreating mm -hmm. and maybe just kind of withdraw, uh, got depressed, something like that. I do remember now that there was something else that happened mm -hmm. and he wanted to run away because of that. Well, yeah, anyone in their right mind would. Yes. And shortly after, maybe a year later, some other kid was found dead as well that they said he committed suicide. And it was similar, like, setting for some reason. So that seemed a little odd as well. That one is no longer there. And it's a completely different washed out place now, which I will talk about real quick. But before we get to that, we have kind of our favorite, but not our favorite. Uh, well, I think you have like a love affair with her just because she's so large and in charge <laughs> in Boyle Heights. Me, I have a different experience. We're talking about the lovely General Hospital. Yes, go ahead if you want to share LA about that. County USC Hospital, which has changed throughout the years. But one thing has remained the same in her Art Deco uh, self looking like a lion that's how i feel like she looks like yes. an egyptian lion standing upon the hill staring down at everyone else she's was built in 1930 1932 and she was uh in working condition until 2008 um she uh is an institution all of herself there is a, a ward inside the hospital. I don't know if you guys know this. And we have an episode, too. A so full episode on, the on hospital. her. On her. We call her her because they call her mother. Yes. And they refer to her as the woman. The uh, mother on the hill. The mother on the hill. So now she's become this larger than life persona. And we refer to her as her or mother. Yeah. So um, mother, this woman, she ha she hosted a whole floor. It was the whole floor. The 13th floor of all things. Of, of all places and all numbers. and The 13th ward of her, the building was for the jail ward. Yes. And um, it, it was completely for um, the, when they had procedures and they had to go to the hospital, they were there locked up. And um, there's so much more to that place. And again, you definitely have to go back and, and recheck our our episode um this the general hospital had 19 stories it had 800 beds it's a teaching hospital and um the hospital was used for the most vulnerable in the los angeles area everyone was welcomed into the hospital and um 
that was pretty big for what it was in Los Angeles when she was initially built. Toward the end, she was pretty obsolete. Uh, it General Hospital is definitely an institution in every way that we've described everywhere else. Just maybe a little bit more nicer in a prettier lobby, <laughs> in my opinion. Yes, because I think the, compared to all the other places we're talking about, this one does have beautiful architecture, even though... And it still does. It, it is. They're saving it because they're not going to tear it down. But ironically, we added this hospital because it does tie in with the rest of the institutions. It is an institution, a county institution, but it ties in because of the 13th floor where uh, inmates from the L.A. County Jail would be transported there and kids from Central Juvenile Hall, because it's really across the street, pretty much would be sent there if there was like she said, any medical procedures to be done. So not many regular hospitals we see here have a jail ward. No. That one did. It did. And if they do, it's much smaller. This one had a whole floor, you know, like a whole little lockup. Yes. And uh, it she reads just like the rest of them. She's not far from uh, Central Juvenile Hall to start off with. And uh, the hospital's been there for a very, very long time. When we did many episodes, and I always tell you this, they all interconnect. Everything in Los Angeles interconnects when you break down the history. And when we were talking about the Zoot Suit riots and um, the murder at Sleepy Lagoon, Jose Diaz was uh, pronounced dead at General Hospital. And uh, they all interconnect. Yes. And that was the hospital everybody went to during his early days. And then you have some memories there. You don't have to get into detail, but just a brief, you spent some time there. And if you want to hear all the details, please listen to our episode on it. Yeah, definitely. My son was, had a procedure there in 2007. And of course, life was different for me and for him back then. And I, at some point, he was in women's and children's hospital when it was still open. At some point, I just remember being so upset and depressed and I was sitting in the jack in the box directly across from the coroner's office and just thinking like, how am I going to get past this? And just thinking about the death that I see across the street and the hospital looming across the street and uh, inside the hospital, it feels like death and I don't care for, I'm, I'm glad. I'm really glad Women and Children's Hospital is gone. Yes, that was directly diagonal across the street from the General Hospital. It was part of the same institution, yeah. but they focused this one on women and children. That one was built in the 50s, so it looks super funky mid-century. And Tunnels. We, we seen it get demolished. Ton- and, we, and I was happy about it, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I couldn't have been happier. The staff was off. The security was off. It looked like an institution from the lights and the ceiling to like the linoleum floors or the flooring, the walls. You just felt like you were an institution and it didn't really translate to like healing, at least to me. And my son has many medical needs. So we've been to the hospital, lots of hospitals. And this one was so far away from where I lived in the harbor area. And it was really hard for me to get to. So I I had a lot of personal things going on with this hospital. And to this day, I'm still trying to see how I feel about General Hospital. I also did an internship there uh, years back, like years back in my when I started my career in my um, schooling. And we'll leave it at that. Um, I did it in the new hospital. And um, the new hospital is lovely. Right next door. Right next door. Literally the down the steps. And it's like right there. And the new hospital is lovely, but, um, you know, General Hospital, she, she's always watching. Yes. So just to kind of wrap this part up, we picked these places. They're currently still there sitting in dust. Many of them not significantly architecturally nice, except for General Hospital. But they had a large impact on us and the community because during the time that they were, it's heyday or prime time, a lot of people went through that these places and are either still currently sitting 
with life in prison or have got out now successfully and could look back like, wow, like I was there in the 90s and even up until the early 2000s. And they, at the time, it was lock them up, lock them up. And why are they shut down? Because that obviously caused an effect. And they ha- they realize in some ways, I don't know if they were forcefully realized, they, it, did, it didn't work well. And they had to be shut down. And there has to be other interventions. And it also contributed, obviously, like I said, to mass incarceration, which infl- was inflated in the 80s. 90s 2000 barely now maybe the last seven to ten years there has been change of people coming home actually getting a second chance at life but that's only 10 years right there's yeah. and there's for many years everybody that has been still locked up and there's still some that are waiting to get out and i guess it just it shows you that it's as fickle as whoever the governor is in position um, really rides on what's going to happen with incarceration um, down the line. Right. The, but that, that, that's what I mean, like the abandoned part. That would, would it, when I think of that, I think of those days and yeah, it's come. Yeah, it, they're just, they're, we know people that were there. It affected our lives. And some pe- some of these people, are not necessarily functionable. That too. And while we can't contribute all of it to the institution, the institution played a large role into why these people that are full-blown adults our age are unable to um, take care of themselves. Yes, and that's a good point you make because I've seen a lot of YouTube videos, like interviews with people on Skid Row, and... A lot of the people that are very chronically ill, chronically mentally ill, or maybe full, really deep addiction, a lot of them have been either McLaren Hall or the juvenile halls. And now they kind of live, they kind of dysfunction, they live the dysfunctional life through the years. And, and some people went down that path and some people were able to get past that and become successful. But either way, it was still very like, it, it impacted people a lot. And even the ones that did become, get out and become successful, they still are affected. There still could be some triggers there. There's still those memories of living in these institutions as children, losing their, you know, childhood or teenage years growing up in, in these places. It's true. It's true. And it, it's something that we now know, as you had mentioned before, it doesn't work not only doesn't it not it doesn't work but those are the most vital years that we teach children uh how to be adults how to be in society how to contribute and not take away from and when you put them in a place and lock them up and it's violent and they're treated like a number they no longer have their identity it's no wonder it becomes a snowball effect and they become adult offenders or they're stuck in a place yeah recidivism and everything else that comes with that yeah so that's kind of like a a brief of more more of the history but we did want to add a little bit of the paranormal because of course sabrina her sensitivity to this is important. I don't know if that's what you would call it. That's fine. We'll call it. We'll call it whatever it is. Um, but my spidey sense. Her curiosity <laughs> with the paranormal has been sparked in some of these places. Definitely, um, the hospital. Even going as a mother of a patient, I remember my first experience in that hospital, going to see my son, and there was there was a lockdown. Like not like within 15 minutes of me arriving and we had to lock the door we were in. I don't remember what it was. I do remember a tunnel and everything, I guess for me, I could feel kind of like, uh, and don't think gross guys, like a throbbing kind of feel like from the atmosphere. Okay. And, um, Immediately, you know, so it's it's something more than just the average. It's paranormal. It's it's an energy about the hospital. The general hospital gives that off 
she definitely has a presence. Yes. And I um, challenge anyone who says that she's an inanimate object to go and stand above her or not above her, in front of her, to the side of her. And then let's see what you you have to say after that. Uh, McLaren, McLaren Hall was terrible. I remember going around the side feeling so sad, but it really hit a, hit me at least when we were in front of it, looking in the doors. And I can only describe it as a feeling, a feeling of just desperation. And that feeling was not mine. So I'm taking it off of something else mm-hmm. and just feeling so sad and overwhelmed with sadness. And the rain was just perfect for that moment I could just cry you know it's really easy for me to cry anyways yes I agree and just to real quick on the hospital I think since I did that episode there's been a few people or a couple that say that have that do work there or work there I'm not sure their role but they have felt paranormal activity in some of the floors of the old hospital I only went there once and I did mention an episode where I had a friend that um, got hurt and I went up to one of the floors. I can't even remember, but I remember, like I said, pictures of old nurses in black and white pictures and with the old nursing outfits. To me, that was creepy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but taking the elevator up to a high floor and the waiting rooms were like weird and big. Like, I don't know. It was just really old. And that's just all I remember. But if my memory sparks, it just was not very welcoming it just felt like creepy vibes but like we said people were born there and people died there so it's exactly and that's something that all these places have in common is that there was death yes even though we don't know how much death happened in all these places there was definitely death even we were talking about nellis the cemetery right they have their own personal little cemetery yes that they say is there somewhere yes So with Nellis, there was one article that said that there was a cemetery there in some corner by a tree where they would bury the kids that didn't have parents back in the 1800s or turn of the century. It was never confirmed. I don't know if they kind of buried him somewhere else or they left them there. But during those times, a lot of these institutions did have cemeteries behind them somewhere, especially with kids that didn't have like no family. So I believe there was, and um, who knows what happened to the bodies. Well, not just that, but like, what about all those other kids that, you know, you can get rid of? Yeah. Not just in the 1800s, but I'm sure there was plenty other times where things were swept under the rugs. Yes. So Nellis now is a big community now. It's like one of those brand new townhome communities that they built with all these not fancy, but just like townhomes that you could buy for almost like 700000 And they have, you know, the typical community center, pools. Everything kind of looks the same. So they raised everything off and they built this community called The Groves at, in, at Whittier. And I think they started building like about three years ago when we went. We couldn't go fully in. Yeah, but I did. <laughs> let us, yeah. I did go yesterday, and they did keep some buildings, some of the old cottages, I guess to kind of like not completely get rid of everything, but they turned them into community centers, and they, they're they still working on some of the other ones, but I did, we did go in, and we went to, to one of the buildings that used to be the old administration building, and now it's like a, like I said, a community center, or people had, I think there was somebody having a birthday party there. And then they have, like, this lobby where they have, like, the history of Nellis. But it looks so, like, no murder was happening, no suicide, no kind of trauma. It just looks like, oh, this was a reform school for kids in the 1800s. So it was, like, they try to make it, like, yes, we're telling you guys the history, but not fully all of it. Of course. if uh, Just another way of patting patting themselves on the back and, like, forgetting the past. Because if we allow this past to slip through our fingers, we're we're deemed to repeat it yes so there's definitely when i think of the people that live there like the energy there like i can't they have no idea no idea 
And they're, the energy over there is thick. Yeah, it was. We've walked around there many times. Yes. And even between them and King Richard's, which has so many different different items from different eras and different times. It's like a thrift store, antique store. Not a thrift store, more of like an antique store. Anyway, that whole area is just, it's got so rich with history. I mean, if you think of like, you know, Whittier and the times and I can go on, but I will not. And it's full of energy. Yeah. And that area surrounding Nellis is no exception. It's permeable. It's it's tangible and it permeates the atmosphere. And if you listen closely, you can feel it. You can hear it if you allow yourself to. Yes. And. I mean, even you were investigating it like with equipment, but just you're feeling the vibes of just like that. Yeah, because I'm like an old, tired lady that never brings out her equipment anymore. But I have investigated enough hospitals and prisons and Preston Castle and other like jails here in Los Angeles to know that when you have that many people together with emotions running high, low, all over the place you're bound to have something echo into the walls of the facade, something that never really goes away. Even if you break down the facade and all that's left is rubble and you build over it, it never leaves the land. Absolutely. So what is the future of these places? (laughs) Because now we're in 2022. (laughs) These places are kind of in the dust. Except for Nellis, it's completely gone, but we, we know that now. What is the future, and why is that important? I think what's important is that we redirect. And when talking about this, we were talking about General Hospital. Yes. You said that you had read... That, that they're going to do like a, home, a facil- not a facility, I don't want to say that name. They're going to do housing for homeless because it's a huge building and it's been there to, since 2008. That's the least that they can do. Yeah, so I, I would be, that would be great if they could do something like that because right now we have a huge homeless problem. It hasn't happened yet. It's kind of talk right now, but hopefully it does. Yeah, they really need to speed it up. As far as srcc or the clinic the norwalk clinic right now it's currently being occupied by across the street is the metro state hospital which is a a different entity and during covid they transferred non-covid patients to sr so they could use one of the buildings so there it was like a temporary use but i did read that the city of norwalk wants to make it like a shopping center kind of slash you know, when they're shopping with like apartment living and things like that. So something kind of fancy. And they think that's all great. But I feel like, I don't know. I don't care for those places personally. Well, I think that it just, it's gentrification. Yes. We forget who the population was of the incarcerate, incarcerated. And when you take that away and you put fancy things upon like death and destruction and sadness and depression and suppression what are people thinking like you're just coloring it you know like you're sweeping everything bad that went away because it was an eyesore it's always going to be there yeah so we don't know if that's going to happen but that's what they're talking as far as central juvenile hall they could probably tear that one down it's crummy yeah (laughs) they probably could tear that one down. but that one happened so recently we're not sure what's going to happen and LP is being used partially for this program for homelessness. I think it's called the Butterfly Project or something like that. And it is for homeless women, I think under 25. And they kind of changed some of the buildings to make it a little bit more welcoming. And the cells that used to be cells, they made them into their bedrooms without the big door. Yeah, that's important. (laughs) That's not necessarily a bad thing as far as f- no. for sure if it's if it stays like a program. It's almost like you're, you're starting to come up with programs to clean up the fucking mess you made like years ago from the parents, you know, that you incarcerated. These are the children and you're going to have to deal with it one way or another. Yes. And then last but not least, McLaurin Hall, it is used right now as like a clinic for some organization. It's not related to the county. It's a private clinic. I think it's just temporary housing, but 
because the lawsuits are still pending, it's just kind of sitting there. That one, I don't know. That one should probably go. I think that it should go immediately. I think it should be a community center. Something. Right right? now, it's like a, it feels like a warning. It feels (laughs) like a warning to the uh, surrounding community. Like, you better watch out because you'll end if you, you know, you don't take care of business, you could be here. Yeah. That's how I feel when I see it because it's just, it's in a weird place surrounded by houses middle and stuff. of a neighborhood yeah and it was normal at the time i guess but i think when i did the post on mclaren hall i had some people that told me they lived around there and there was a couple of times one person said that one of the kids did run away and you know she gave him a sandwich and things like that like they ran there was a lot of kids running away all, all the time yeah i can't imagine why they would want to run away from that mess yes but so we'll see what happens with the future of and this is just a here in LA, I mean, we have institutions all across, and I don't know if you want to consider deinstitutionalization, but that's kind of the route they're trying to do, I think, uh, and have more rehabilitation, more of a holistic, more not just the incarceration. At least that's what the talk is. I don't really believe it, so I see yeah. more of it. Yeah. But that kind of wraps up our episode on the impact of institutions here in L.A. So kind of just to make you think, if you didn't know about these places, now you know if you did, they they did affect you in some way, then it's something to really, you know, think about. Like, how was your experience with with these places? If you guys want to follow me, I'm uh, I'm Doña Junta on Suami Chronicles. You can find our podcast page on Beyond the Facade Podcast on Instagram. And we also do upload the videos onto YouTube, which we'll be doing this one as well, this special episode. So if you want to share your info, Miss? I am observing spooks and other vices. And honestly, you guys can just look me up at Sabrina the Grown-Up Witch at this point because I'm more active on that one. Although it's going to be like my kids, so FYI. But Okay. And then just shout out to Santos and Wayne that helps us usually with the editing. But we did want to give you the information on Slanguage, the show that's going to come up. So the show is called We Run Things, Things Don't Run, We, October 22nd at Angel's Gate at one of the art galleries there. And it's a 20-year celebration of Slanguage Studio. Woohoo! And I will be posting the flyer and it, when, that, when all that comes up. And, you know, just shout out to Mario and Carla from the Slanguage family because they're the ones that, you know, started this. So... This episode will premiere during the art show on the 22nd. Definitely go and support. Yes. Thank you so much. And until next time. Bye. Peace out.